It's Wednesday. Let's chat. Hi, I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of StormAsia.com, and this is our series of web chats covering a variety of topics uh, coming to you on the first Wednesday of each month. Um, today, we've got a light, lighter topic that we're getting into. It's going to be fun. It's going to be engaging. I've got uh, four panelists who are very different in terms of their perspectives and outlooks and where they have come from and where they might be going. Uh, as the topic is about living away from home. So uh, for many of you in the audience, you might have lived away from home. You might be thinking about living away from home. Uh, so you might have questions that you might like to ask the panelists. Uh, please feel free to do that on the Q&A or the chat boxes that are on screen. Um, so very quickly now, why do people move? Uh, for various reasons, some move for work, uh, others move because they are drawn to a certain place. Uh, some others move because they are pushed from a certain place. Um, <laughs> many reasons, right? And then many say that uh, there are opportunities elsewhere in terms of their own personal development or professional development. Um, some say the grass is greener on the other side. I will contest that I say sometimes that's because of the quality of the menu that you have there. <laughs> so you still have to deal with all kinds of things. Uh, and living abroad is exciting. It's a challenge. It's an opportunity. It's many things that come together. So today's uh, group of panelists, we've got uh, a couple of professionals who have moved uh, into other countries to do their thing. Uh, we've got a recent graduate who has moved uh, and we've got a retiree who has moved. So let me just very quickly uh, introduce them to you, and then uh, we can find out what made them move. So we've got Nicole Chu, who is the Area Director of Marketing Communication at Minor Hotels. Um, that's in Bangkok. And she worked in the hospitality industry in Singapore for many years uh, before moving to Bangkok. Uh, Hello. We've got uh, Hamish Brown. A familiar name, I'm sure, to many of us here in Singapore. <laughs> uh, he's a DJ, a radio personality, he's a voice talent. Uh, he moved to Koh Samui some years ago, and uh, then he moved to Penang, where he <laughs> is uh, living now. So we'll soon find out why he did that. John uh, Chapman, Fortune, uh, he's a PhD uh, science graduate uh, who came over from the UK on an A-star scholarship. Uh, he liked it so much that he decided to return and he got married too in the process to Singaporean. And uh, making up our quartet, uh, Mark Fury is a global sales manager, uh, LNG offshore and marine and services at uh, Trelleborg Marine and Infrastructure. He's originally from South Africa and has lived in Dubai for many years before moving to Singapore. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, let's uh, chat and have a nice, uh, relaxed afternoon getting into your lunch. Yes, exactly. So while you guys are enjoying lunch, let's start the chat here with uh, Nicole. Um, maybe a bit about uh, why you decided to make the move and a bit about yourself in the process. Yeah, so um, my name is Nicole. I'm obviously a hotelier. I've been a hotelier for about 12 years. Um, and I think for many reasons, I've always wanted to kind of move abroad. First of all, growing up, um, when I was growing up, I was actually quite privileged to have a few years um, to live in the U.S. And I think that really gave me a very different perspective of the world and the different cultures. Um, and even after that, going back to Singapore, um, my parents would always bring us away every single year. And eventually when I got my own job, I started to travel all of Asia, Africa, U.S. And I was like, the world is so big. Um, and I think at the back of my mind, there was always something um, that was always taunting like an irritating earworm that kind of goes like <laughs> okay you got to try something else you got to try something else so I think during COVID when kind of we see life differently right as many people would say I kind of took the leap of faith with my partner and I said you know what let's go let's go explore and let's challenge ourselves so um, I don't I can be honest Thailand was not on the radar at all I was thinking like London would have been great or New York you know where the hype and the buzz of of hospitality was at but for some reason we ended up in Bangkok and I have to say I am loving every bit of it don't know if Singapore is going to be in my radar for a few years but <laughs> yeah I think at the end of the day I think it's it's when you move abroad one of the things that I've learned 
um, the most is that you really learn how to be independent and you really, as overwhelming as everything is, the the contrary of that is that everything is just 10 times more rewarding because you're starting from fresh and you're doing everything new on your own. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for that, Nicole. Uh, Mark, a bit about uh, why you moved and uh, about yourself. Yes, uh, well, I go a little bit uh, further back than Nicole does. Um, <laughs> but growing up in Africa has always been like that. Um, as children, we've grown up, it's you're always outside. Your parents don't want to see you indoors until the sun goes down sort of situation. So we've always been adventurous. We've grown up with wild, big open spaces and things. And uh, in 2000, I had the opportunity to relocate to Dubai. Um, purely based on work and it was very well organized, uh, fantastic. Um, the culture was fantastic to embrace, people were very nice. And I think it's like any country you go to, as long as you surround yourself with people, friends, and you're prepared to reach out and not just be stuck in your little box as you go along, things will be fine. People will reach out, they will help and they'll assist you. So. The interesting thing, having uh, relocated to the Middle East and working in Dubai, was I was actually responsible for India and the Middle East. So from a South African point of view, is we found it was far easier to move into Africa and go to visit other countries in Africa, get visas out of Dubai to go into Africa, it was far easier than actually doing it in South Africa itself, which was quite interesting. Um, we did go through a phase of trying to open an office there for two years, and that was exactly the problem. You needed to take a two-hour flight from Cape Town to Johannesburg, going to Uganda or into Angola. It was just a major headache. So we found our base in Dubai was the best place to do that. And yeah, after 10, 11 years in Dubai, uh, the sand got a bit much, I suppose, and I got the opportunity to relocate to Asia. So as you said, the grass is greener on the other side, <laughs> literally in my case. <laughs> Dubai, <laughs> and dry, Singapore, <laughs> and wet. very simple. So um, I've been in Singapore now 10 years and very similarly, um, surround yourself with people, reach out, make friends. I do a lot of cycling, cycling and, and adventure and things. And it's interesting. Any country you go to, you meet people from all over the world, you make friends from all over the world. And that's great. The only thing you cannot get rid of in all of the locations I think we live in is family, because suddenly you become the holiday destination. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> but that's uh, pretty much where I am at this stage, uh, okay. still in Singapore and uh, loving it. It's a great place to okay. live, uh, safe, <laughs> uh, secure, similar to Dubai, uh, not so much in Africa, but that's where we are and uh, enjoying it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, John, tell us a bit about your journey. Um, basically, I uh, I got offered a PhD position in about 2016, and uh, I had heard of Singapore, but honestly, I couldn't locate it on a map at the time. Um, but too I, small. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I had about, about a year to prepare before coming, and so I learned a little bit about what it would be like, to be honest, Singapore is very highly praised in the BBC, for example. They, they said that Singapore had the best secondary education in the world, and uh, among other things, an immensely safe place to live. But also my colleagues were laughing at me. They kept on telling me that I wasn't going to do any work, and I, I couldn't figure out why, and they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so, um, so you found out for yourself? I, I found out, yeah, it was... Uh, Basically, they, they pay you a bit more as a PhD student here than in England. And um, I, I formed a pretty tightly knit group of uh, friends over here, but mostly Europeans, ironically. And um, the work is like a little more slow. And so, uh, but but I, I really enjoyed being here. I, I really enjoy the weather. Uh, consistent sunrise and sunset just seems to agree with me uh, on a deeper level. And um, uh, yeah. I, I do miss England, but but I, I was really happy to come back here. I, uh, I met my partner here, and uh, we got married last November. And congratulations. So yes. yeah, congratulations, yes. Thanks, guys. Uh, she, she was a little hesitant, hesitant to move to the UK, and so I, I'm kind of like in transition in life at the moment, and so I was happy to come back here and, and settle for, for a while at least. Okay, cool. Uh, we'll pick up on some of those points uh, a bit later. Uh, okay, Hamish, huh. over to you. 
Oh, okay. So, uh, seeing as how I'm the, the retiree here, uh, the reason I moved from Singapore is really because uh, as a DJ doing morning radio, I get up at 4.30 in the morning to be ready for a 6 a.m. morning show till 10. And then you stay another hour in the station to do all the admin. And then you run to your own office, which I was running with a few of my partners till about four or five, almost six o'clock. And then you go back home and change and get ready for uh, the event that you have to do at night. You host on stage and that goes on till about maybe 11 ish or so. And then you go and sleep and then you get up and do the whole thing all over again for like five or six days. So that was really uh, what I was doing for practically all my life. And then I told my wife, I said, as I was approaching 50, I said, I'm facing burnout. I know I'm going to burn out. So I wanted, I want to stop before I hit that, that uh, burnout point. And she said, okay. And I said, in my work, I had gone to Thailand uh, and I loved it. And Nicole's smiling there. (laughs) (laughs) But Thailand, you know, every time I I went there for, it was work. So it was either in Bangkok or Phuket or, you know, and all these places. And uh, one of the last times I went there, I told my Thai contact, I said, you know, I love this country. I I have dreams of retiring here. Uh, But, you know, Phuket's always the destination that I think of as work rather than relaxation so he said you should try samui and i'm going like where's samui and then he said ah you see if singaporeans don't know where samui is you'll like this retirement place so i you know i i i found out what samui was where it was it was in the gulf not in on uh, not in the andaman sea and i went there i loved what i saw it was very rustic it was very laid back and I said to myself, and this was like in the very early 90s, uh, they had just opened up the airport in Samui, I think back in 89 or 90 or something. And I went there about 94. And I said, when I'm ready to retire, I'm going to go there. And that's what I did. And uh, just before I turned 50, we turned up in Samui and we bought a villa there and we stayed there blissfully for nine years, enjoyed it. And actually, the Samui leg was my dream retirement. I loved it. I, I totally loved it. You know, you get up, you watch the sunrise, and you you pick up on things like watching the sun move across the horizon from the summer solstice to the you know the the winter equinox and back again. You see all these things as a retiree. You don't see it when you're working. You know, because some people will say. The sun comes up in the morning. I go to work. That's it. It comes back. When I come back from work, the sun's down. But as a retiree, you see all these smaller things and then you enjoy it. And then after about nine years, my wife says, I love Thailand. I love the food, but I like some variety, please. So I said, where do you want to go? Can we do some Pranakan food? So we applied for (laughs) the MM2H visas. We got them approved and everything. And then we moved over here, which we bought. We sold the villa in Thailand, liquidated and everything. And now we're here. We're in Penang. Uh, We're coming up on our first year here. And... You know, as the saying goes, happy wife, happy life. Oh, <laughs> there you go. That's okay. that's that's some advice for you, John. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, I've already learned that lesson the hard way. Many, many <laughs> <laughs> so for, for, for you, Hamish and uh, Mark, you've uh, moved to different countries. What was it like uh, trying to adapt? with each change first from your native place to a new place and then uh, and then on to another place. Does it get easier the more time to do it? Or do you face all sorts of new issues? Who, who wants to go first? Mark, Mark, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so for me, it was quite interesting, obviously having, if, if you're relocating and you have a company assisting you to do it, Dubai was quite easy because you have what they call a PRO, which is like your HR person. He will take you for your medicals, your visas, your passports. He'll introduce you to people and and show you how you've got to move through everything. Singapore was a bit of a different relocation. Uh, Got headhunted, moved over here. Also a bit of an introduction and uh, by people. But Singapore is far more organized when you come to apps and IRAS and all of your visa applications. Everything is pretty much online for the most part. Dubai has in recent years caught up to that, but Singapore is just very easy to get everything done online. Internet is fast, your mobile phones, you get uh, internet connections, everything is relatively fast. Um, The moving part is still obviously a bit stressful. How do you relocate? How do you find places? 
Um, I think a lot of people will identify in Singapore, for example, now, if you are renting, for example, it's a very much a rent-based culture. Suddenly pricing goes up, the, the situations in Hong Kong, for example, we suddenly have a lot of people moving into Singapore. So property prices fluctuate, your rental properties for food, hawker centers, everything fluctuates quite a lot. So that's been quite a challenge if you're looking at reloc of, uh, renewing your leases, for example. There's no set fee that says, oh, it's going to go up 5%. Some instances it may go up as much as 40 or 70%. So that's <laughs> the stress between the two places. Um, from an ease of, of relocating, no issues between the two international companies. And again, same thing. I've got the outlook that it's what you make of it. Um, if you're going to sit and you're going to complain all the time, that's just going to be your life. Get out there, do it. If there's a little box you need to tick, tick the box. You are not going to change anything. <laughs> that's just the way it goes. And Hamish? How is it in terms of cost of living between uh, Dubai and Singapore? Actually, actually, a very interesting question. So even if you look at the, the currencies and things and taxation, they both actually very similar. Dubai in recent years has become a lot more expensive because you're starting to pay for or be taxed on a lot of services you were not in the past. So the big difference for, for, for me relocating here, for example, is if you live in Dubai, you live in a villa, it's big, the rooms are big, everything's big. So for the same amount of rental that you would be paying or property you're buying in Singapore, property is far more expensive and it's smaller purely due to the nature of obviously you're on an island, you need to maximize the space. So your lifestyle changes that way, for example, depending on, on if you're just relocating the majority of people relocate to Singapore, we find ourselves moving into an apartment or a condo, uh, even renting HDBs at, at the moment, whatever's going and that's available is what we're finding is the best way to go. And that's that's the major differences between the two. Okay, all right. Uh, Hamish, how about uh, yourself? Uh, I think uh, for us, when, when we moved to, to Koh Samui first, um, it was my dream. Uh, Lena was happily at least uh, along for the ride and she was happy with that. But I think when we got there, some of the things that we had to do, first of all, was unlearn a few things. Because I think uh, Mark's right. I, in Singapore, it's a very regulated society. And we, you know, my whole life is there's regulation. You, know, you can't do this, you can't do that, or you're, so and so and so. When you come to Thailand and Samui, uh, it's not that there's no regulation, but there is this thing where the, the phrase in Thailand is sabai sabai, you know, and, and, and Nicole's laughing. She knows exactly what I mean. So, you know, I, I mean, it's everything. You know, you, you everything goes. It's, it's happening. You don't have to rush, and 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 people just do the things naturally, and you just have to accept that. You, I think, in Thailand, um, coming from Singapore, where everything is is regulated, and you, you follow a set of rules, and you get things done very quickly, and you instructions are given, and they're followed, and what have you. I think in Thailand we unlearned that, and we said, okay, can you do this? And everybody says, yes, 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 and you expect that. It'll be done eventually, but you have to give them time. So it, it, it's, it's that kind of culture that you, from Singapore to, to Thailand, it's something you unlearn and then relearn, you know, for, and that's what we did for nine years. I mean, like, ultimately, at the end of the day, what I liked about Thailand was the fact that, uh, and I, I found this out by accident, actually, we drove to uh, Central Festival, which is uh, in Koh Samui. They have this, this uh, it's, the, it's their version of a mall. And you can park underground, uh, covered and everything. And I was expecting to pay, but they don't pay. You know, there's no parking fine. There's no parking charges, anything at all. You just park. You go there at 10 o'clock in the morning, leave your car there, shop the whole day, eat the whole day, whatever. And then five, six o'clock in the evening, go back to the car and come out again. Let me tell you, for a Singaporean who has to pay fines left, right and center, that is heaven. <laughs> I mean, like, come on, you know, you know. So for nine years, that was what it was. And uh, we, we also what I loved about Thailand was, uh, and some way is you can drive to anywhere. You, you can drive to a, a, a restaurant right on the beach. You park right in front of the restaurant. It doesn't have to be a car park lot. It just seems to be, it's an empty space. The first one there, you go in there and park. That's it. And, you know, the, you go out there, the restaurant owner greets you, you're happy, everyone's happy. And because the island was so small, I think at the height of COVID, after all the tourists had to go back, after all the uh, the ties that were living on Koh Samui 
who had come to Koh Samui from other parts of Thailand because they were looking for work. When those tourists left, uh, the island just remained indigenous people and the long stayers like us. Um, that left only about like 40, 40 odd thousand people on an island, one third the size of Singapore. Let me tell you, we've had four jabs for, for the COVID thing. The first two were, uh, let me see, in the 1st of April and the, at the end of April in 2020. And then there's one more jab in October of 2020. And my fourth jab was in February of 2021. Four jabs. My wife and I have never had COVID. And, you know, at the height of COVID in Samui, it was like, there's only 40,000 people here. There's no density. Everybody's going around. The only time we put on the masks was when we had to do to government offices and the hospitals. Everyone else was just walking around maskless. It was, it was as my friend would say, gosh, you're in Koh Samui. That's the best place to be in COVID right now. Nobody's wearing a mask. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Okay. And Maybe then we also moved. because of, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, you want to ask you about the move to Malaysia, how that uh, related to, to your, your well, uh, when, move? Well, um, when we decided to come to Malaysia after getting the MM2H, because we applied for the MM2H visa back in 2019, and we got it at the end of 2019, uh, then COVID hit for two years, so we couldn't move, uh, and we waited until you know, COVID subsided and we sold the villa and we came over here. When we came over here, what I what was struck me about this place was the fact that everybody here is just so chill. <laughs> and I mean, you know, in Thailand, yes, everybody loves uh, you. And even if you don't know the language, you try. I mean, I was trying very hard to speak Thai. You can, I know phrases, I can, uh, I can order a few things in Thai. But once they start getting into a long, drawn-out conversation, that's it. I am gone. You know, I, I just cannot keep up. There are too many syllables. There are too many. There's just the tongue goes into gymnastics you never thought possible. So you you really can't. It was very hard for me. Anyway, uh, we come to to Penang, and you know, I mean, I took Malay in, uh, as a second language in Singapore, which is great. But everybody here in Penang speaks English, which is perfect. Um, you can speak Malay if you want to, but you, and my wife can speak the Hokkien if they want to, but everybody speaks wonderful English here. It's not a problem. Communication is easy. Um, I, we can't ask for anything better. And the food. Oh, my God, the food. Come. <laughs> what can I say? I, I'm in the gym three times a week just because the food's too good. <laughs> it's a hard life. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. So, and I, a lot of Singaporeans love to make that journey to uh, Penang just for the food. <laughs> but they go to Bangkok for the food too. Uh, so, you know, you, you do make these trips, right? These short bursts. Uh, you go and uh, visit a place. Uh, did you notice any significant differences between visiting a place and living there? Um, and did that influence your perspective of the country as a result? Nicole, I'm sure you've uh, been many times to Bangkok as a tourist. Yeah. Uh, what's I it mean, like living there? I've, tra I've traveled a lot of places and I always thought like, oh, you know, I, I kind of understand, you know, after like a week or two, you're like, oh, I understand the people. I understand the lifestyle. This is great. But and then eventually when me and my partner decided to move to Bangkok, we're like, ah, it should be easy. We're in Asia. Everybody's kind of the same. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it is everything but the same. Like Hamesh was talking about how Sabai Sabai, like that is literally their religion here. Everything is so much slower. Yes. And they're just so much, they're just, they're always happy. Everything is just so slow at their own pace. There's no sense of urgency whatsoever, but you just, you're just having to adapt. You're just sitting there going, so I remember going for a couple of meetings and Singapore, everything is due yesterday, kind of, right? And you would have, you would ask them, so when can I get this? And they will keep looking at me and they'll go soon. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's soon mean like when? And they'll just keep going, soon. Soon. <laughs> soon. And I spend like at least three minutes just questioning myself, like, what does soon mean? <laughs> and, and they just, and I, at the end of it, they were like, we agreed that it was going to be like three weeks from now. And when I left the meeting and I was like, so three weeks, right? And then they replied, soon. soon. <laughs> and I was like, okay, soon it is. And then I left. But 
I mean, did you get it yeah. in three weeks? No, I never did. I never. I'm <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Survive, survive. Yeah, but I guess overall, yeah, you really, it's very different when you're living here and you're living like a local, you're going to the local spots, you're going to get your, your you know, you're, you're meeting with the local people, you're talking to them. There are going to be expats that you can sort of gravitate to because they also had to go through that transition. But when you're working with the locals or you're talking to them or you're going out with them, it, it's it's a it's a lot of changes the way certain things are said you know like Singaporeans were a little bit more straightforward you can't do the same thing here in Thailand you have to um, say it in their way and kind of work around their pace and, and kind of adjust yourself ac accordingly so it, it has been very different culturally um, and also the infrastructure of Thailand is very different from Singapore I think uh, Mark mentioned Singapore is just you know everything is so you live your life so easy everything is done for you given to you on a piece of paper everything every bill that you want to pay is on one system <laughs> it has connects everything together in thailand it doesn't work that way you have to go yep. to this thing to get to this thing and then you go to another person another person and you spend half of the time just trying to connect the dots and fit the puzzles together yes you know so you're just sitting there going okay how do i connect this with that and and you end up having to learn and 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 navigate your way through. So one of the things that I've learned the most having lived in Thailand for a year is that you have to be extremely flexible and versatile and whatever that is tossed to you, you just have to embrace it, good or bad, you just take it and just live in that moment and then work work around it because it is not going to be like Singapore. Everything wise from systems to financials, to economy to business, it's 100% different. And I think because I've lived in Singapore for so long and I've always, I've what I wanted was a change. I felt like this was a good change for me. I don't know if it's for everybody. For me at this point in time, I feel like I'm really loving it. You're enjoying it. Yeah, so much. Sorry. Yeah. I think, I think, uh... Nicole's enjoying the challenge, which is nice. And it's having to navigate things, find out things. It's, it's a lot more fun. And it's, as you say, everything's often just given to you. But yeah. it, as a person, it speaks to you a lot as, a, as your character as a person is you've gone out there and it's you've not gone to fight the system. You went, well, I've got to learn. I've got to work with it, work around it and just carry on and just do it as well, the locals do. Yeah. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you know? Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, and it's not like you have a choice. You're literally forced into it. You're just, yeah. you've, you've just got to do it or you leave the country. The country's not going to change for one person. That's what Correct. I mean. Correct. If, if some I... of the concerns that you might have had before making the move. I mean, uh, you could have had like, maybe you have a medical condition uh, and you wonder, will the medical facilities there be the same? Would it match up? Oh, there could be other issues. Uh, what was, for each of you, what uh, was like uh, one of the major concerns you had before making that move to the new place? John, how about you? Since uh, you'd never, you couldn't even find it on the map initially. That might have been <laughs> of some concern. <laughs> well, actually, but before coming to Singapore, um, you have to get, a, from the UK at least, you have to get an HIV test, a tuberculosis test, and a chest, chest X-ray. And luckily, yeah. I wasn't here, but... Um, yeah, for some reason, the humidity in Singapore seems to make my eczema like worse than it's ever been. I don't know, <laughs> but like, I get like full body eczema here. <laughs> in England, it was just a few little patches. Uh, but I, I don't know, maybe the food, maybe it's the humidity, it could be anything, you know. But uh, were you able to find a fix for it? Is it an issue? Just take, take pills, that's all I've got. <laughs> Okay, so so you just carried on with your own uh, uh, routine, and that's all it is. Just have to adapt as best you can, I guess. And uh, yeah. uh, it okay. seems like being in a sauna, like steam room, seems to help. But that's a bit of a random suggestion, though. Yeah, because I think I think John, some of that is it's quite different. It's it is like Singapore. If, if you leave anything standing a long time, or you sit sit too still for too long, it's going to grow on you. It's a yeah. chunk. <laughs> if, if, you, if you travel around in Singapore, one of the most common things, even tourists or everybody will see when they're here, is they are continually chopping the jungle down next to the roads. Yeah, just that's true. Going. And it's exactly as you say, the sauna might help with a drier sort of heat. But um, yeah, <laughs> it is a battle. But going back to what Kanan was saying from a medical point of view, I was very fortunate in that you look at the Middle East, it was very fast growing in Dubai as a medical hub. 
specialists from all over the world. Um, and Singapore is very similar. You go to the NUH, National University Hospital. They've got doctors from all over the world. And touch wood, if you're ever in an accident, that's where you want to go, the first first stop. Um, and I think, as, as from uh, Arish was saying, from the, um, as you're getting older, maybe I think we would consider the medicals and things a lot more when you're moving and, and longer term. But they've got packages from all over the world. So you can do sort of packages with international cover, local cover. But I find that in Singapore, your, your general local GP cover is fantastic. You have a lot of locals that are young doctors that are not in their own practices yet. And they are practicing on their own. They, they move from location to location, right. to improve themselves. And um, yeah, that's the one thing I've noticed is from a medical point of view, if you've got a reasonable medical in Dubai and, and here in Singapore is the only places I can really speak of, um, you're fine. Um, and even as a tourist, anything happens. The common thing you see with the tourist is uh, the moon boot, stepping off a pavement or slipping on something. It's covered. It's yes. part of your insurance. It's part of your cover. Travel insurance is obviously a great thing to do. My side, personally, from the cycling, I travel to Penang. I go to Kukup and all these places in Malaysia and things. Mm -hmm. And from a cycling point of view, we've got very specific cycling insurance that if you do end up in an issue, you can get out. And it's not that expensive, but it's reasonable. Yes. It's like any country you're going to, if you're going to go and travel just as a tourist or going to relocate somebody, obviously look at what the medical covers are and plan accordingly. I, I think I agree. Um, as speaking as a retiree uh, myself, I, I was actually very fortunate to have a very good insurance agent who was an excellent friend as well at the same time. And he got me a, a great uh, insurance package that also had a, a, kind of like an a, a international rider built into it. So that um, in Samui, a few years back, I had a, a bout of dengue. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish dengue on my worst enemy. It's that bad. So I ended up uh, being really, really feeling very down and then finally going into the, the hospital because I hate hospitals and I really try not to go in. But uh, my wife dragged me in there and said, okay, you know, I got to go into the hospital. And the doctor just took a look at me and said, yeah, you definitely got dengue. And then he, I told my wife to get on the phone and talk to my you know, insurance guy in Singapore. And while she was talking to to my insurance guy in Singapore, the the hospital staff in, in Samui had already wheeled me into the room. And I was already in my room, a big room, by, by the way. Yeah, they had one bed there and a big sofa on the other side. They kind of like, no, okay, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the missus wants to stay over. Yeah, you've got this thing all laid up there. So I, I can't complain on that. And so if you're retiring, you want to go overseas, make sure you have a very good insurance agent that works an international rider as part of the deal. That helps. I think it's not just retirees, right? Anybody who's anybody, yeah, absolutely. This sort of uh, you never know what could happen. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Nicole, how about you? Well, I've had a very interesting uh, medical journey since I moved to Thailand. Because um, earlier, the first day of the new year, my partner um, actually tore his meniscus. Oh. Uh, yeah, and it was terrible. Because first of all, we don't. In, it's not like Singapore, right, where you, you call your parents or you call your friends and they'll recommend this doctor and that doctor to you. When you're in a country all by yourself, you're like, OK, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. So we literally show up at a hospital and we're just trying to, like, navigate our way through. And one thing I will say about Thailand's medical system is that it's very advanced. It's a lot more advanced than people perceive it. Yes. Uh, it's 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 a huge facility and they've got so many around Bangkok that you can literally choose from. They actually have doctors from all over the world or medically certified from the US or the UK that are working here. So for us, overall, it was a very seamless process for us. And we felt like, I mean, Thailand is also a lot cheaper. So we basically was able to stretch our buck a little bit further um, to the point where even on the day of the surgery, they would call us two days before to confirm our appointment. And when we got there, the, the nurses and everything was already waiting for us at the entrance of the hotel with the wheelchair to bring us to the room. And like what um, I think Hamas said just now was that they have a bed for you if you want to do that. They have meals that are not just one course. Yeah, they had like a Western menu, a cafe menu, a Chinese menu, a Thai menu. Yeah. 
<laughs> so you were like, is this a staycation or is this a hospital? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah. So I was like, okay, the medical is not bad. The only thing about Thailand I would have to say is just the language is still an issue. When you're talking to nurses, they're so, yeah. they want to help, but yes. they don't know how because they, mm. we can't, we can't communicate. Yeah. So it's almost like a chicken and a duck trying to talk. And the only common word is pain, pain. <laughs> And then they go, oh, okay, okay, we understand yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> and why didn't you use things like uh, Google Translate or some other translation uh, device? I mean, there's so much of it out there. There, so there is, but it's only going to get you so far. There are so many times where I would Google Translate and I would show it to my friend or my colleague in Thailand and they look at it and they're like, what are you talking about? This is completely <laughs> off. You're going to get like 20% of the actual message there. Because so, it's 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 a tonal language because yes. it's the same word, but with the tones, it means like the same word can have 10 different meanings yeah. just on and tone. On top, yeah, and on top of that, how you write it will also affect so if you're going to write it in full sentences, it might translate to something else versus if you did a shortcut, it might yeah. translate to something else. So it's really a, a Russian roulette. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Life okay. is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> try, try cutting your hair in Thailand and you ah. try to explain what you need. I walked out looking like I was a Korean hair. I got a Korean hairstyle gone wrong. It was just, <laughs> I was like, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> I think Hamish and I would know what you'll get. You know. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have that problem. We just figure out which soap we want to use, body or head. Works very well. Yeah. I'll make it work all the way around. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Minimize the fuss. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, on this point, what were some of the amusing things or the you know the, the fun things that uh, happened while you lived overseas? John, any fun things happened to you? Besides Exiba? Uh, <laughs> uh, I can't like the life in general just became more fun for me because um, you know all of my colleagues lived just like 10 or 20 minutes away from me and uh, we like I, I thought that I had kind of put most of my drinking life behind me before I came here but I ended up drinking more than I have ever <laughs> had and more frequently as well and it's just yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you have the right buddies. That's what's going to happen, right? Yeah, I'm, going, I just, I'm sure drinks are a lot more expensive here than they are back home. Well, we would just always look for the most budget thing possible, and we basically always ended up at Holland Village at the coffee shop on the corner, uh, just drinking Tiger. Like I've put more liters of Tiger through my body than than I probably have water. <laughs> <laughs> That is, that, is so true. that is so true. And that's one of the things you learn very quickly in countries like Norway, for example, which I travel to a lot. Alcohol is ridiculously expensive. Singapore is very much the same. If you try to explain to your mates that you're spending sort of 18 or $24 for a pint of beer, they're like, sorry. <laughs> and that's, yeah. You learn very quick to go to a hawker center and you sit and you get a very cold beer glass. You get a nice big quart of beer for $6.50. Wow. Yeah, we definitely put away a lot more honey. Can I recommend Thailand? It's probably half of the price of that. <laughs> I was gonna say <laughs> the Chang beers. I, yeah. I I I think for me the, the the funny thing that I like, and I I don't know whether it's funny, but for me it was something very meaningful. Was when we first made the trip over to to Thailand. Um, we were living up on a hill in a villa uh, about 160 meters above sea level, and the closest neighbor was uh, down the hill, maybe about uh, 50 meters or so down, but at least a good walk uh, that'll take you about 20 minutes away. Um, and we're quite isolated. But in that first month, um, the neighbor came up because he knew that it was a new guy on the block, a new, a new couple on the block. And they were very nice. They made us feel welcome. And that uh, then transferred over to the rest of the neighbors very quickly. And within Within less than three weeks, I think, we knew just about everybody in that con enclave. Um, same when we made the move here to, to, to Penang. Uh, we're in a, in a low-density, two-blocks estate. Uh, and, and we know the, the, the neighbors here fairly well. Uh, they, they are quite welcoming. I say this because we were staying in Singapore for the longest time. I mean, all our lives. And we, we owned a, a condo in the West Coast, and we were living there for four years. 
um, in the Botania. It was called Botania. And I must say in four years, okay, yeah, I, I get up early, 4.30 in the morning, and I'm out to make the six o'clock radio show, and I come back almost before sunsets. But in those four years, I didn't even know my neighbor. I had no idea who my neighbor was because I hardly saw the person, you know. And I sadly, uh, maybe it's the success of Singapore that people have so much work to do that they don't really make all the connections. I just found that when I've gone to another country and, you know, you're you're the only one there, you suddenly make the connections very quickly. And then they become very long lasting friends, so to speak. So that's the reason why I think um, that's that's one of the things I like about going to different places and meeting people and making connections with them and almost lifelong collections. Because although I've left uh, some we, I still, you know, the, the they, they still contact me online and what have you. And we have long chats and, and what have you. And it, it keeps us I think, connected. Yeah. I think one of the challenges a lot of people face is assimilating into a new environment. Mm. I remember when we were living in Australia for a few years, the first time we moved there, uh, friends of ours from Singapore, we were just staying with them until we sorted out our, where we were going to live. Uh, brought us to a place and then the stallholder was a Malaysian guy and he said, oh, new people uh, in, <laughs> yeah. in Australia. You know, this is where you should live. And then he named three places. This is where all the Singaporeans and all the Malaysians yes. uh, live. So immediately we decided, great, we're off to Fremantle. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we didn't want to be anywhere near that sort of environment where you get sucked in. Uh, Why move from Singapore to a place and then be with the Singaporeans. Singaporeans yeah, right? yeah, that's so, right. Uh, so the assimilation have... that takes place, uh, John, I'm sure you've assimilated quite well. Uh, do you think that oh, as a younger person, it's easier for you to assimilate versus Hamish for you as a retiree? Is it, I mean, as a retiree mindset, sometimes it's okay, I don't need to do things. I don't need to meet people so I can just do what I want to do. You know, so it, the assimilation aspect, is that something that uh, you faced or, or you enjoy? John, you first. Yeah. I do enjoy, like, yeah, every, I traveled a lot when I was, when I was living here last time and um, I've traveled to like many different uh, parts of Southeast Asia, East Asia. And yeah, I, I do enjoy engaging with the local culture. It kind of, it feels like I haven't really been on holiday if I just go abroad with my friends and we just talk to each other to some extent. Um, yeah, it's kind of harks back to what we were talking about earlier about about the rules and stuff. Like, um, yeah, you know, the transition coming from England to Singapore is mostly like engaging with the inflexibility of the bureaucracy, but like it's highly efficient and it it really works. Like, I really respect that aspect of Singapore, but it was really difficult to like to get used to, you know, doing things so methodically all the time. Um, yeah, I would just say my to anyone moving here is to you should try and make some local friends if you can because the rules dissolve somewhat when you know people uh you know to a large extent in in many cases um, yeah that would be my advice uh from from a retiree from a re from a retiree point of view for me um the connections uh, we made uh, in some we uh the first couple that welcomed us there they were an australian couple george and louisa and they had neighbors who uh, one was a Scottish man married to a uh, Filipino. <laughs> and then there was another American guy married to a, a Mongolian lady. And uh, finally, it was a Welshman uh, who had a Thai wife and another Australian married to a Thai wife. So that was the retirement community there, which we didn't realize until, you know, very quickly about two weeks after we 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 first went to Samui. But that was a close knit community then. It's it's here as well in Penang. It's the same thing too. So like I say, you know, the assimilation is faster than you expect, but you just have to be open to it. And yeah, we look I forward. I like to I it. have the opposite of what all of you are saying. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know because you know, um, maybe for 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 me, I I always feel like it's easier to make genuine connections when you're obviously very much younger, right? But maybe also because I'm a, I'm a woman and it's different. So for mm. guys, right, you're like, hey, want to go for a drink? Want to watch a game? You know, it's just very easy. And then you just slowly build up from there. But women like, oh, do you want to go for coffee? And you have to talk. And if you're not in sync, it just doesn't, it, you, you just don't want to go any longer or meet up again. So yeah. I feel like for me, it's been a lot more challenging to find that genuine connection or that girlfriend support that you need in this, in a very different environment. Mm. 
Yeah. Are you a more picky sort of person, Nicole? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I, also, <laughs> I feel like that was a bit of a no. Um, no, lower I, the standards, just a yeah. tad. <laughs> I think it's not. I, it's, it's not that I'm picky. It's just I we work. I work five days a week, sometimes six days, depending on the schedule. And I feel like we. I just don't have the luxury of time to be with people that I just don't feel like I have like I have to force myself into having that connection and I think for me on top of that is like I guess safety is also an issue for me sometimes people come up to you and they're like oh you know you're at a restaurant or you're a bar and they come and chit chat and I always have to kind of ask myself is this really a genuine approach or is there a, a you know another reason to why that person so mm. in a way it's it, it, I think it plays both end one I am maybe a little bit picky but at the same time it just also have to question is this really a genuine connection or purpose or does it have a second reason for why he or she is approaching right yeah, it's always good to err on the side of caution I guess yeah yeah uh, Mark, uh, just, I, mean, I was, uh, was going to say, I, I, I can identify like with Nicole, for example, is maybe it's like, yeah, I'll go for a glass of wine, not a cup of coffee, different situation. But like with Harish as well, I, I can identify with Singapore is coming here as well is it's very much a culture of where people tend to mind their own business. Mm. They're within their own lanes. They don't really push the boundaries too much. Um, I've obviously had the exception to the norms on that. And the common thing for me that I've always found quite amusing and funny is when say, have you taken your lunch? <laughs> it's the greeting. <laughs> it's the Singapore greeting. So I was always, <laughs> um, okay, or, or what have you eaten for lunch? And you like, you start going through a list and you can see the person sort of glaze over like, just like that's just a common question, sort of, how are you? How are you? Yeah. It's just, have you taken your lunch? I love that. So what, what we did here is obviously the area that we lived in is, um, we had also some expats, some people from India, some people from Holland, um, Singaporeans, Malaysians. So what I did is I approached, I approached the people because that's what I would do in Africa. We gregarious people, we barbecue and we drink beer. So that's the case. And we started a street party. And the only uh, two years that didn't happen was during COVID. Right. So we basically brought dishes from all of our own countries. And in Singapore, you've got all the helpers and things. So it was lovely. And we did it every September have the whole street party with food from everywhere from the different countries. And the funny thing about the street party was I took a cone and it's in a cul-de-sac and I put a cone in the middle of the street and they were like, you don't have a permit. You don't have a liberty. <laughs> I, was coming in. I was like, the only people that would be coming into this road are the people <laughs> living in the street. Let the kids run amok on their skateboards and things. But everybody was so worried that I did not have a permit for my cone I put in the road. Yeah, yeah. Never okay. been a problem in all the years. So yeah. Okay. So from an assimilation point of view, I, I agree with everybody. It's it's what you make of it at the end of the day. Go out and make friends. Um, learn about the culture. It's not necessarily that people are standoffish. Some of the cultures are more respectful and won't want to intrude in things. Um, that's just the way it is. Just go yes. out and make friends. And as as John was saying, go out and make local friends find local places. Otherwise, if you are living in a new country, you're just going to act like a tourist anyway. You're going to Google which yeah. are the top 10 rooftop bars, which you're never going to experience the underlying culture and the essence of the country and the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly, yes. Okay, just to wrap up, uh, can I ask each of you, at the end of the day, where is home? Famish. Home is definitely where the heart is. <laughs> I mean, wipes over your shoulder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she's, uh, yeah. she's right here. She's is right that here. <laughs> Home is where leaders. Yeah, she, she's it right here. <laughs> uh, in terms of country, where's home? Um, I will always be Singaporean. Uh, you know, I, I'm 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 proudly Singaporean because I believe you know it, it is one of the 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 biggest and best countries, in my opinion, one of the best countries ever. Um, but I think I can be Singaporean, but I also think that it's okay to be Singaporean and enjoy what the world has to offer. You know, be a global traveler. If you have, if you have the ability to, then take it, go out there, live a little bit, go to another country. You, you never, I'll be like a Anthony Bourdain, you know what I mean? Like a, do things that you, you, you never thought you would do. 
go out, uh, go to another country at four, go to a bar at four o'clock in the afternoon or something and talk to someone that you wouldn't talk to that that kind of thing, you, you never know what life can put up in your way. Uh, and you might, you know, you, you might strike out and say, oh, you keep nothing in, in common with the person, or you might actually find out that he's got something to say, you know, the, the, and, and then you you can trade on on these, these these differences and find something that connects the both of you. And the only way to do that, I think, is is to be brave and to take that leap. You know, you 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 have to you, you have to go out there and find other shores, but you need to have that um, you need to have the bravery to to get rid of the shore that you're leaving to see the the oncoming shore over there and lose sight of the shore that you've just left. Because if you don't do that, you'll never be able to to embrace new things. That's what okay. I think. Okay, uh, Nicole. How about you? Similar answer. I feel like I, I am probably Singaporean. Obviously, Singapore, I will always be a Singaporean citizen. Um, and Singapore will always be my safety net that I would go back to if anything was to happen. But I, I agree on so many levels that just because you're Singaporean doesn't mean that you have to live in Singapore. Um, there is a lot more that the world has to offer. And I always feel like there's two sides of the, the coin, right? You could be Singaporean living in Thailand or Europe and whatever, and you're actually showing other people what Singaporeans are like. So yeah, yeah that's how that's how I see it. But yeah, 100% always going to be Singaporean. I mean, it's 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 just a, always going to be that safe place that you can go back to, that your support system is always going to be there waiting for you anytime you need it. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mark, how about yourself? Yeah, so for myself as well, I mean, I'm proudly South African at the end of the day, and I believe you're an ambassador for every country you come, you come from and you live from live in and, and that you identify with at the end of the day. I'm very proactive when I talk to people about South Africa and the, 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 the issues they've got and the opportunities and the people and how fantastic things can be. So that I think you take through with whatever country you go into. As myself in a global role, I've been very fortunate to travel all over the world. And that's the message I take to everybody about South Africa, how we are, how gregarious are and friendly we are and things. But I'm also on the other side looking at the world in that I'm enjoying these different cultures, learning about them, understanding them. And it's a common thing about South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. You know, we'll never shout for Australia when it comes to cricket or rugby, but we'll support New Zealand. <laughs> the, everybody in the world understands that. So, yeah, for me, proudly South African. But um, it's also very difficult when you meet people. Um, I met a friend, a partner, and uh, in Singapore that now lives in Austria. <laughs> so yeah, it's very difficult. So you've got to plan where you travel, what you do, all these sort of things. So it's a bit of a challenge, but just go out there, get it done, make a plan. It's, you don't have to be in the same place at the same time. Just yeah. look at your life, make it work and explore it. That's it. Go out and just do it. Okay, great. And John, how about yourself? Where's Hall? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, since I've been in Singapore, I kind of like, I, I feel more English than I ever have done before. Uh, I like, I do love England, um, but it's like, I, I agree with everyone else. Uh, I, I feel at home in Singapore now as well. I feel like maybe the like the paperwork constraints may stop me from being here forever unless I get citizenship. But I, I still feel at home here. Uh, but my family is spread across the world, like in France, Barbados, Trinidad, America. And so like, yeah, it's a cliche, but it's it's wherever my family are, pretty much. Okay, perfect. This is quite spread out for you then. Um, Great, it, the Hamish, uh, Nicole, Mark, and uh, John, thanks. Uh, it's been it's been quite an entertaining lunch chat. <laughs> uh, a lot of things to pick up on for the different places that you've lived. Um, but you know, it's all an adventure, right? So open your mind to it, accept yes. it, take what it comes. If you go to a bar and talk to somebody and they say some interesting things, like give me a wallet, you should also <laughs> take uh, note of that and be cautious. Uh, <laughs> Uh, enjoy life with some caution thrown in as well. Uh, thanks again for being on this chat and uh, to the audience for, I hope you went, had an enjoyable lunch as well, uh, hearing the panelists uh, in this session. To the next one. Thank you.